Well, good morning. <clears throat> so today, <clears throat> what I would like to do is talk about lime soda ash, ash softening. We'll talk, review hardness, talk about lime soda ash softening, the whole softening process. <clears throat> um, process considerations, design considerations, and then outcomes. And I will do that. I thought I had uh, uploaded the recording um, of lecture five to learn, and obviously not. So I will do that after class. So thank you for reminding me uh, about that. So I'm going to turn off the video so that I can focus on the tablet here. Uh, feel free to interrupt if you have any questions. Uh, as we proceed through the lecture. So hardness. <clears throat> hardness is a term that's used to characterize the ability of the water cause soap scum. And that's because calcium reacts with soap, complex it, and that causes that scum that you find around the faucet, uh, on the sink, on the bathroom walls, etc. It also increases the amount of soap needed to achieve a lather. It causes scaling on pipes, as you see, as you see in the pipe here. <clears throat> causes valves to stick because the calcium carbonate crystallizes in the valves. There's a lower flow, and that allows the crystals to actually form, and it leaves stains on plumbing fixtures. When we talk about hardness, <clears throat> we talk about total hardness, and then we divide that into carbonate hardness and non-carbonate hardness. So total hardness is the sum of all polyvalent cations. So that is for example, calcium, magnesium can also be either iron two or iron three, depending whether it's oxidized or not. Manganese, again, two plus, this, this case two plus or four plus, again, depending whether it's reduced or oxidized and any other polyvalent cations. Practically, it is the sum of calcium and magnesium. Those are the two species that predominate in most waters. So therefore, you typically concentration of all other species are much smaller. And then as I mentioned, it's divided into carbonate and non-carbonate hardness. So carbonate hardness is often called temporary hardness. And that's because when you heat the water, the, car the carbonate hardness precipitates. So if you have hard water, and for instance, you look at the inside of a tea kettle and you see these little white um, specks, that's calcium bicarbonate or calcium carbonate, can also be magnesium bicarbonate or magnesium carbonate. Now, carbonate hardness is equal to the total hardness or the total alkalinity, whichever is less. less. We can illustrate that here. So let's say we have calcium, and the concentrations are not all that important. And then we have alkalinity. And I'm going to represent the alkalinity as bicarbonate. And that's because alkalinity, don't remember, is equal to OH minus plus bicarbonate plus two times the carbonate concentration minus H plus, and the concentrations are in 
millimolar or molar units. Okay. So in this case here, our carbonate hardness, switch colors so that we can, so what is in yellow is the carbonate hardness. Okay. So in this case, the carbonate hardness is equal to the total alkalinity. On the other hand, if I draw my bar graph in this way, we'll assume we have the same concentrations. But in this case, now the alkalinity exceeds the total hardness. So in this case, again, now what is in yellow? Again, that's still the total hardness. But notice here, the total hardness is less than the alkalinity. So in this case, the carbonate hardness is equal to the total hardness. In this case, the carbonate hardness is equal to the alkalinity. The non-carbonate hardness is called permanent hardness, and that's because it's not removed when heated. So <clears throat> just kind of thinking through solubility. When, <clears throat> turn on my video now since I'm looking at the screen. So thinking about solubility, when you want to make a cup of tea and you want to put sugar in the tea, is it easier to dissolve the sugar in iced tea or hot tea? Hot tea, okay? Most compounds are more soluble in hot water than they are in cold water. On the other hand, calcium bicarbonate, magnesium bicarbonate, and the carbonate species, the opposite is true. They're less soluble in hot, <clears throat> in hot water. And that's why they precipitate in a hot water heater. On the other hand, non-carbonate hardness is that portion of the calcium, the hardness, that's associated with chloride, nitrate, sulfate. They behave like sugar. They're more soluble at higher temperature, so they're not removed in the hot water heater. The total hardness is equal to the sum of the non-carbonate hardness and the carbonate hardness. So the question that was asked is, is total hardness just magnesium and calcium? Typically, yes, okay? Typically, when you're looking at magne sorry, manganese or iron, you're talking about concentrations that are in most waters that are less than a milligram per liter. So the contribution of iron and manganese, and those typically are the most prevalent of the other polyvalent ions, are small compared to calcium and magnesium. So for that reason, hardness is typically just magnesium and calcium. So let's look at the previous example here. And we'll change color. Let's use the highlighter and we'll use blue. Okay. So for the first example, this portion in blue is the non carbonate hardness. For the other example, the non-carbonate hardness is equal to what? So for the example on the right, the non-carbonate hardness is equal to zero. Zero. 
So this concept is extremely important because it governs everything that we do in terms of hardness removal. Now, typically, we try and remove the calcium. And the reason is it's cheaper. And we can typically tolerate about 40 milligrams per liter. And we use as calcium carbonate of magnesium in our, the water without causing problems in the plumbing systems. Okay, and the biggest problem is in the hot water heaters because if you're precipitating out minerals on <clears throat> in the hot water heater, you reduce the efficiency. So typically, in terms of units, as I mentioned, what we typically use are milligrams per liter as calcium carbonate or parts per million as calcium carbonate. And the reason is we're adding concentrations of different species. And we can't add them together as milligrams per liter. So we need a way to essentially normalize these concentrations. Now we can normalize with using equivalents, but for whatever reason, the industry didn't use conventional chemistry terminology and they developed their own. So they developed the, ter the terminology of using milligrams per liter as calcium carbonate. In the wastewater section, you probably talked about using <clears throat> milligrams per liter as nitrogen or milligrams per liter as phosphorus. Yes? The reason we do that, yes? I was going to say, I don't really actually remember. <laughs> okay. Well, I, you, you've got a test coming up. and Yes, you do. And the reason you do is because, so for instance, with nitrogen, you can have ammonia, you can have nitrate, you can have nit nitrite, you can have organic nitrogen. You can't add all of them together as milligrams per liter. So in order to have a set of units that we can add the concentrations, we normalize the nitrogen to as N, so as nitrogen. Or with phosphate, we can have multiple phosphate species, we can have organic phosphate. <clears throat> so what we do is we use milligrams per liter as phosphorus. So it's the same sort of approach that we do here with as using as calcium carbonate. So about two thirds of New Zealand's water supplies are surface water supplies. And these typically have low levels of calcium and magnesium, typically about two milligrams per liter of magnesium. Now that's as the ion and 12 milligrams per liter as calcium. So that hasn't been converted um, to units as calcium carbonate. New Zealand has a drinking water standard for hardness and has a maximum hardness of 200 milligrams per liter as calcium carbonate. That's different from here. Here we have no regulatory limit for hardness. In fact, on the Michigan State University campus, we have groundwater. That groundwater up until very recently was not treated. It was chlorinated, but other than chlorinated, it was not treated. And it has a hardness of about 450 milligrams per liter. So extremely hard water. In New Zealand, hard water is considered anything greater than about 180 milligrams per liter. So it's interesting the difference in kind of what's tolerate, toler tolerated um, here versus um, in New Zealand. And just to give you an idea of kind of levels, these are locations with hard levels, hard water. So it's considered hard water. Christchurch water is extremely soft. However, and I'm not going to try and pronounce some of these, um, but in Canterbury District, you see water about 105 to 110 milligrams per liter. 
here, that's considered a desirable level. So for instance, where I live, which is about five miles from campus or about seven, eight kilometers from campus, um, we have water that's softened and the limit that's, or the desired objective is about 105 to 110 milligrams per liter. Gisborne, it's a river, ranges from 100 to 180 milligrams per liter. Uh, Hawks Bay, I don't have levels, but a, it it's harder water. Otago, also harder. Um, and Fanganu, um, about 140 to 160. In the U.S., none of those would be treated. And these are hardness levels in Auckland. Um, or they're actually just, they're rated as moderately hard or soft. Thing to note here is the variability. You do see in this area that the water is all moderately hard. But then you see, if you're looking in these areas that are fairly close to one another, in one case it's soft, in the other case it's moderately hard. So it's very difficult to just look at location and automatically know whether it's going to be a hard water or soft. So in terms of objectives, the goal is to reduce the concentration of calcium and magnesium. Like I said, typically that's somewhere between 100 to about 120 milligrams per liter as calcium carbonate. We also want to make sure that we're producing water that's an acceptable pH and non-corrosive. And you'll see that what we're going to do with this process is raise the pH. So we're raising the pH to precipitate out the calcium and magnesium, but then we have to reduce the pH before we distribute the water. At the same time, we may also use this process to meet other drinking water standards. So for example, in Michigan, we have an area that we call the thumb. So Michigan kind of looks like a mitten. There's the upper peninsula, but we often forget about it. But so this area here in the eastern part of the state is called the thumb area because it looks like a thumb. Um, and that area typically has a high arsenic levels. It's typically hard. So by softening the water, you can also precipitate out the arsenic because the arsenic species will sorb to the precipitate. So you, you can achieve the regulatory limit for arsenic and also achieve a desired hardness. So in some cases, softening is used for that purpose too. Now, I have these two <clears throat> um, graphs here to one, emphasize the fact here that most of the pH of natural waters is between about six to 8.1 or so. So in that range, what you see is that bicarbonate or carbonic acid at the lower pH predominate. So for now, if we look at the solubility, the solubility of calcium bicarbonate is about 170 grams per liter. But if we shift the equilibrium, to where carbonate predominates, now what we form is cal calcium carbonate. And notice there, the solubility is on the order of milligrams per liter. And you can see that here in this graph here. So by raising the pH, we reduce the solubility and we can precipitate the calcium. 
And that's what we're doing. Same thing with magnesium. Most of the magnesium, if we have a high alkalinity, is present at, as magnesium bicarbonate in most natural waters. That has a solubility of about 37 grams per liter. If we have considerable non-carbonate hardness, so where we have considerable non-carbonate hardness, we'll have magnesium sulfate. And notice it's even more soluble than bicarbonate. But what do we do? We raise the pH. What we want to form is magnesium hydroxide. And that's because the solubility of magnesium hydroxide is so much less than the solubility of magnesium sulfate or magnesium bicarbonate. So what we're doing is shifting equilibrium in order to precipitate out the calcium and the magnesium. It's as simple as that. We also, in this process, can remove other species, like arsenic is one. We can also remove iron and manganese. So for instance, if we have greater than about half a milligram per liter of iron, that iron precipitates, and it can stain clothing. The manganese can stain clothing. So we can achieve rem <clears throat> um, remove precipitation of those. Looking at some of these mineral, other metals here. So for instance, if we look at zinc, so if we look at zinc here, if we raise the pH, we decrease the solubility of the zinc. But we have to be careful because if we continue to raise the pH, we actually increase the solubility. It's not true for nickel. Look at nickel here or cadmium. But for some of the metals, if we exceed a certain pH, you can see it for lead here, okay. then we resolubilize the metal. So it's important to know what metals are in the water and what and how that pH will affect the solubility. So the reactions that we have are all here. Groundwater often has a high concentration of CO2. So what I've done here is I've color coded everything. And I apologize if you're colorblind, um, but I've tried. Um, so the species we're removing is in red. The chemicals we're adding are in blue. And the chemicals we're forming, the precipitate is in green. Now, if the CO2 is greater than 10 milligrams per liter, what that means is we're going to use an excess or an excessive amount of lime and we also precipitate a significant amount of calcium carbonate. How much hardness do we achieve by this reaction? So how much hardness removal do we achieve by this reaction? None. So that this first reaction costs us in chemicals that we're adding and costs us in sludge that we we're producing that we have to treat and dispose of. So for that reason, if the CO2 level is greater than about 10 milligrams per liter, we want to strip the CO2. So we typically use an aeration process to remove the CO2 from the water, reduce it to about 10 or less, and therefore we minimize the chemical addition and minimize sludge production. The second reaction we're removing carbonate hardness due to calcium. So notice it's just calcium here. We're assuming that the calcium is associated with bicarbonate. So we've got a pH, let's say, around 7. 
we add lime, we form calcium carbonate that precipitates, which we then settle, treat, and dispose of. We can do the same with magnesium. So we add lime. Notice here, we produce magnesium hydroxide and we're also producing calcium carbonate. So notice this, we're adding calcium in order to remove the magnesium hardness. So we're shifting the equilibrium to form magnesium hydroxide, we're, but we're forming also forming calcium carbonate sludge. So it's costing us. It costs us double. It costs us in chemical addition and it costs us in sludge production, treatment, and disposal. So remember that kind of as we're going through. We want to minimize the costs. We want to achieve desired removal, but we also want to minimize cost. If we need to remove non-carbonate hardness, we need to add soda ash. So the reason you hear lime soda ash softening is because we're adding the soda ash in order to remove the non-carbonate hardness. If we need to remove the non-carbonate hardness due to magnesium, we have to add lime and soda ash. Again, we're produce, for, we want to form magnesium hydroxide. We're also going to form calcium carbonate. We're also going to increase the total dissolved solids of the water because we're adding sodium to the water. Now, when you treat water. The, you treat, or when you add, if you add a stoichiometric amount of lime and soda ash, you don't achieve zero hardness. You achieve about 40 milligrams per liter as calcium carbonate. And that's because the, there's still, the calcium and magnesium is still somewhat soluble. So some of the hardness ions remain in solution. Precipitation reactions are not instantaneous. Acid-base reactions are instantaneous, but precipitation reactions are not. They take time. So there may not be sufficient time in which case these are reactions are incomplete and there's some calcium and hardness left in the treated water. And then there can be short circuiting. So there's non-ideal mixing in the reactor and therefore there's calcium and magnesium left in the water for that reason. So looking at the different options in terms of treatment, we can divide these up into what are referred to a single stage split flow and two stage. So we'll look at these. The first group that we'll look at, we're only adding lime. So in <clears throat> now in this case here, the mag the magnesium is less than 40 milligrams per liter. Okay. So we typically use the magnesium along with the total hardness as the criteria for determining treatment. As I mentioned, we can tolerate 40 milligrams per liter of magnesium in the water. So if it's less, we typically only add lime and we're removing the carbonate hardness due to calcium. So thinking back, I don't know about you, I find that thinking through these 
in this way, kind of thinking through the bar graphs, okay? <clears throat> in this case, we'll assume this is the alkalinity, okay? So in this case here, we're gonna remove the carbonate hardness due to calcium. So what I've shown in orange. We'll only add lime and we'll raise the pH to about 10.3. So thinking back, that's reaction two. Now, if the magnesium is greater than 40 milligrams per liter, and these are as calcium carbonate. Now, because of that magnesium depositing on the hot water heater and the heat exchangers, we want to remove that too. So in this case, we're going to remove the carbonate hardness due to calcium and magnesium. So now I wanted to change colors. I didn't change it. But now we're going to remove all, both calcium and magnesium associated with the alkalinity, so the carbonate hardness. So shown here is a single stage unit. We're adding lime. So we add lime. If we're only precipitating the, cal the carbonate hardness due to calcium, then this is the reaction that predominates. If we're removing magnesium, then we're looking at the second reaction too. Now notice we add CO2. Why do we add CO2? Because the water leaving here is somewhere between 10.3 and 11.3. We can't distribute water at that high of a pH. So we add CO2. The CO2 reacts with water to produce carbonic acid, which then lowers the pH. So we want water here at a pH of about 8. We can go up to about 8.5. In terms of calculating the amounts, you can use stoichiometry, which is actually what I prefer to do, or you can use these schematics, which basically walk you through the process. So you can look at, okay, which schematic best represents the water that I have. The one I just drew is close, C is the closest to it. So in that case, that's telling you add lime equal to the CO2 add lime equal to the bicarbonate, and consider excess lime, raise the pH to shift the equilibrium to precipitate the calcium and magnesium. Okay. Notice in schematic C, I have no non-carbonate non, non hardness. Okay. So in here, now in all of these cases here, the assumption is that the magnesium concentration is less than 40 or equal to 40 milligrams per liter. That's our cutoff. Now, if <clears throat> we need to remove non-carbonate hardness, as we saw in the stoichiometric equations, we need to add soda ash. If you're only removing calcium, both non-carbonate and carbonate hardness, you only have to raise the pH to about 
But if you're removing magnesium, remember you're precipitating magnesium hydroxide. So by precipitating magnesium hydroxide, we need to raise the pH up to about 11.3. So if we can, can, if you think about this, okay, in terms of cost, it costs us less if we only have to focus on calcium and not have to worry about magnesium. Now, we can also have two stage where we add lime in one stage and soda ash in another. And this is typically used if we have a high magnesium concentrations. So we add excess lime in the first stage. We raise the pH, because we're adding excess lime, we raise the pH typically to 11 or higher, okay, or higher. Following the first stage, we lower the pH using recarbonation. So we add CO2, lower the pH to reduce it from about to about 10 to 10.5. And then we add soda ash. So here we're looking at removing the non-carbonate hardness. So we're focused here on the carbonate hardness removal in the second stage, we're focused on removing non-carbonate hardness. So these are the reactions in the first stage. And then this set of reactions are the reactions in the second stage. If we need to remove magnesium, we also need to add lime in that second stage. Notice here in order to precipitate the magnesium hydroxide. So you can see the complexity increases depending on what our goals are and whether or not, or this basically whether how much carbonate hardness versus non-carbonate hardness we have. We can also soften to practical limits. So here, pH is 11.3. As I mentioned, we're never going to achieve zero milligrams per liter. We'll achieve about 30 milligrams per liter as calcium carbonate, 10 as magnesium. So softening to practical limits in terms of the calculations, it's simply based on stoichiometry. So looking at those five sets of reactions, it's just balancing the equations and using the stoichiometry. And the textbook the chapter that I have posted ha goes through a number of examples of softening calculations. So in this case, split flow is used. Now, I've mentioned costs, OK? So remember, we have costs due to the chemicals that we're adding, and we have costs due to the sludge that we're producing. If we can not treat a portion of the flow and still meet that desired limit, it saves us money both in chemical costs and sludge treatment and disposal. So <clears throat> where possible, in this case, carbonate hardness is removed in stage one based on stoichiometry, okay, but the bypass is determined is based on magnesium levels. Remember, magnesium is what we're going to use because it's more problematic than calcium. We'll use that to determine the split ratio. By not, portion, by not treating some portion, we actually can reduce the pH naturally when we mix the chemicals together, and that helps reduce the amount of CO2 that we need in recarbonation. For split treatment, where the raw water is greater than magnesium, the raw water magnesium concentration is greater than 40 milligrams per liter, 
you can use this set of schematics. So the only difference here between this set and the previous set is the raw water magnesium concentration. And this equation here uses the magnesium and the final magnesium concentration, which is typically desired at 40 milligrams per liter. The initial concentration from that first stage, assuming that we're treating to practical limits, is typically 10 milligrams per liter as calcium carbonate. And then the raw water concentration is whatever exists. So using that, we can determine the split ratio. So around here, we use a split ratio of about 80-20. We treat about 80% of the water and the split is about 20 in order. And we still achieve desirable water quality, but that's based on the, the magnesium concentrations in the raw water. And... <clears throat> This is just another schematic from the textbook um, showing again the bypass here. Notice it has aeration here. So the concentration of CO2 would be greater than 10 milligrams per liter. Okay. So that we can reduce the amount of chemicals that we're adding. Now in terms of the chemicals, I've mentioned this a number of times I've talked about lime. We can have hydrated lime. So it's purchased as calcium ox hydroxide. You don't need any special equipment. But more, most often plants use calcium oxide or quick lime. Now that has to be slaked. So we can't add it as calcium oxide. And that's because calcium oxide reacts with water to form calcium hydroxide, but gives off a significant amount of heat. We need to be able to capture and release that heat in a safe way. So for that reason, it's slaked first. It's often slaked in a enclosed environment that can be, the heat can be exhausted. And it's also a powder form, it's toxic, so that protects the workers. Soda ash is <clears throat> sodium carbonate. That can be purchased as sodium carbonate and that doesn't need any treatment before being added to the water. So in terms of the process, <clears throat> thinking about this, okay, aeration is first. We need rapid mixing, as we've talked about before, flocculation, sedimentation, filtration, and then disinfection. And these are just some pictures of some conventional basins. So you can see on the upper right, a paddle wheel flocculator, and then a sedimentation basin. We talked about upflow clarifiers here, just some more schematics from the textbook of the upflow clarifiers. <clears throat> I've provided you with some of the design criteria. You won't need this for the design um, project, but let's get some design criteria for flash mixing, flocculation, and then for an upflow clarifier. Hopefully this helps explain softening. <clears throat>